As Egypt burned, France pulled many other allied countries into the conflict to quicken a surrender without a need to spoil more of the country with atomic bombs. Never once did Britain give the command to stop bombing the Egyptians, and on the 28th of August, Egypt surrendered. There was not much of a trophy, with everything poisoned and decimated. Nevertheless, Britain and France still divided the conquered land to come out victorious and with more own territory than before. Rather than ground, the retrieved equipment from the surrendered troops seemed to be the most worthy price, as this was still useful for Britain's own men. Most citizens were curious to a response from America. Though the Egyptians were the aggressor in the conflict, the nuclear answer was worse than anyone dared to dream up. But America, for the moment, only focused on their southern neighbors and refrained from giving comment. To some, this was a sign of weakness or fear. The most cynical were afraid that this could be sensed as a tempting opportunity to attack America in a response to excluding Britain and France from NATO. But things took a turn for the worse in the East, as news got out that People's Socialist Palestine had capitulated to Israel. Israel was still in an all-out war, and not too long after, word went public that the surrendering transmission was incorrect. People's Socialist Palestine had joined the Warsaw Pact, and in return, had received a message that a continuation of the war would result in a declaration to all allied countries. Israel still claimed some territory and equipment, but for the moment, would take things easy in order to keep the Red Giant from intervening. While people thought that Britain might decide to declare war on America next, this was not the case at all. Instead, they wanted to strengthen the Isles by uniting all of them, and that meant including Ireland. A century-old conflict was about to be sparked once more. With turmoil brewing across many countries, South Korea saw an opportunity to prepare a preemptive strike on their neighboring country. It was still to be decided if this strike would be executed, as it would mean a war with multiple countries and factions at once, but Sigmund Day was of the opinion that it was wiser to have this plan at the ready if other Western countries would dive into a war with the Communists first. Though America was not stating any comment on the happenings in Europe and Asia, it did not mean that they were standing still. Stevenson's government, behind the scenes, supported the coup occurring in Honduras by providing the people with weapons and equipment. Within this chaos, some countries grew bold, like Iraq, that requested the annexation of Kuwait. But Kuwait would be left alone, albeit with a watchful eye from the Western world to see what Iraq would do in response. In Holland, that had now been communist for quite a while, the government wanted to establish communist ideals even more by forcing cultural changes, something that is not easily done on a population. The French Republic also continued its aggressive stance as it took notes from Soviet military strategies used in World War II. With newly gained territory and manpower, France could afford to be a bit more reckless to showcase their power if it came to that. With Britain now pointing its gaze towards neighboring Ireland, it had people worried about the bloodlust that its government was displaying. This also counted for Britain's own people. The government in return assured the people of the country's own strength and reminded them of the glorious days when the crown of England actually meant something. This actually worked and calmed some of the citizens down. The Republic of China was being slowly eaten away by the Soviets in a war that seemed unwinnable. Experts in the West were in total panic. Besides Britain and France showcasing their power, there was now also the risk of the Communists growing to unmeasurable strength if China was annexed by them. By January 15th of 1956, it was decided that South Korea would no longer wait for a first move by a Western country and decided to attack North Korea as they saw the Communists dominating in the Asian region. They achieved a victory over their northern nemesis with ease, as this time they were not supplied by their comrades as they needed the equipment for their own war. South Korea was victorious, but now they were standing on the doorstep of Khrushchev, an enemy of a whole different caliber. America had gone in a route where it publicly supported Israel. This was Stevenson's way of assuring their safety as Israel was on a slippery slope with communists. If a war with the Warsaw Pact would arise, the US would get involved in it as well. In preparation for the invasion of Ireland, 
Anthony Eden jump-started his country into DEFCON 3. And at the end of February, the invasion had officially begun. Ireland stood no chance. Its sons and daughters, husbands and wives fought bravely, but the soldiers of Eden cut right through the country and divided it in two big chunks. Within a month, the entire country was taken over by the British, who claimed it as theirs for a glorious unified Britain, standing stronger than ever. People held their breath for what was to come next. And a mere week later, more bad news arrived. China had capitulated, and a massive amount of territory was puppeted by the communists. This now meant that Khrushchev had gained an incredible amount of power and allies. Chen Jiang would be responsible for governing China in Khrushchev's name, and at the moment, both countries were still at war with South Korea. Korea had been doing excellent in the war over the past months, but with China now siding the communists, experts believed it was only a matter of time before the tide was turned for the worse. With Korea expanding this much and being surrounded by all these potential enemies, Syngman Ne thought it was wise to form a new government, a stricter and more demanding one to ensure victory or at least a foothold on their current position. After the French government had long discussed the benefits of joining the faction of the CAF with the British, they finally agreed to accept the invitation. The colossal victory they achieved over Egypt was a potential trigger for this, and with other countries at their side, they could set the pace of what was about to come. At that same time, the Manchu Soviet Socialist Republic joined the Warsaw Pact. Khrushchev currently focused on the naval expansion, undoubtedly to prepare for a naval invasion of Korea. The US continued to pull the strings behind the scenes, as this time they were arming Tibet. After supporting the Honduras coup turned out positive, they wanted a foothold in Asia, either in Japan or with Tibet, to keep a close look on the ever so expanding communist influence there. In Japan, they did this by instigating strikes. If enough strikes could be assembled, it could force the country to hold snap elections, meaning that America had a chance to put someone in power who in turn would strengthen the US grip without making it look like a military holdup was now the case. And halfway through May, America focused on Greece so that the circle was complete and they now had eyes and ears in Latin America, Asia and Central Europe. With China now joining the war against Korea, they were indeed able to push the Koreans back, but not at the pace or ferociousness as one might expect. Poland, that had been waving between a pro and anti-communist movement for a long time, looked towards another attempt to overthrow the communist rule, a foolish attempt according to some as the Soviet grip had only increased in the past months. With the CAF not having a stable position in Asia like America did, and with losing China to the Soviets, they declared war on India to gain a proper foothold in a country where members of their faction already held territory. As France and Britain were in this war as well, a similar display like the war with Egypt occurred once more. At the end of June, the forecasted uprising in Poland happened. Polish metalworkers in Poznan were on strike and had declared for democratic reforms and to dissolve the communist government. Local anti-communist rebel groups had armed the protesters and had joined in a rebellion. The Polish soon deployed the internal security corps and the Soviets sent in the army to deal with them. With the might of the Soviet army, much like Germany before, this uprising would only last a short time as a mere nine days later the rebels surrendered. And as the bombs continued to drop in India and British and French forces claimed land to divide the Indian nation into multiple chunks, the French government made it public that they had declared war on neighboring Portugal. They hoped to grab a swift victory, as Portugal was so small compared to their own military might. And here too, the bombs fell once more, destroying everything in its wake. As France and Britain attacked India from the south, Allied nations punctured their borders from the northwest, dividing the country even more. At the same time, France had declared war on Luxembourg, but they surrendered immediately without picking a fight. They were small enough to where their entire population could be wiped out in a single day. In the first week of September, two civil wars broke out in two different countries, namely Vietnam and Bulgaria. With the world being broken, revolutionary parties seized their opportunity to add to the chaos. 
faction leaders of the CAF had accepted Korea's plea to join in their faction, a decision that would result in France and Britain being forced to declare war on Russia as well. Many countries got dropped into a massive war in a heartbeat. The world, it seemed, had lost its mind.